So good afternoon. My name's Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director here at the Harvard Law School Library. I'm really glad to have you all with us today um, as we talk about disability, human rights, and information technology. Um, copies of today's book are available outside the door. Um, and our authors will be on hand after the talk to do some book signing if you're interested. I want to let you know also that today's talk is being recorded and it will be shown, uh, it'll appear on the law school's YouTube channel sometime next week. The Q&A period will also be recorded um, just for your information. I also want to take a moment to thank the Dean's office for their generous contribution of lunch so we can thank the Dean for lunch today. Um, so now that we've gotten that sort of housekeeping stuff out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Ashley Stein, um, who's a visiting professor of law here, but also the co-founder and executive director of Harvard Law School's project on disability. And with him is his co-editor, Jonathan Lazar, is that correct? That is correct. Um, who is a professor of computer and information sciences and director of the undergraduate program in information systems at Towson. Did I pronounce that? Towson. Towson, sorry. That's okay. Um, we got Lazar right. That's the important that's part. That's your name. We is got my name. That's more so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our authors so they can share with us some really interesting stuff and I will say just sort of personally being in libraries um, sort of the notion of disability information technology and all of that as a human right access to information technology is really important to us there's a chapter on libraries in the book um, so we look forward to hearing what you have to share thank you thank you well thank you everyone for coming out there are always many competing events at the law school and in the community so we're Ever grateful to see you, and we're very grateful to um, to many of our friends to Radcliffe, from which seminar, exploratory seminar, this work arose, and there'll be another one in June, and that'll focus on development and disability and IT accessibility. And we're very grateful to the library for support always and for arranging the talk. June, thank you so much for the logistics, and beyond that, the library. They're just absolutely the best librarians on the face of the planet, and I certainly can't do anything academically or advocacy-wise without their support. So thank you so much for that. And of course, thank you for um, putting pictures that make us look younger. <laughs> Jonathan sort of said we looked like that when we started the book. but That's right. Not we look a little sure. bit different now that the book is done. <laughs> um, and also a very quick advert. The next uh, HPOD related event will be on Wednesday over with our friends at the Graduate School of Education at 12.30. And I'll leave the flyer up here for anyone who'd like information on that. So Jonathan and I, and more so Jonathan, but Jonathan and I have worked for years on the issue of accessible technology and disability and the intersection between disability law rights and access. And some of the book is, and we've also done some articles together, some of the book is just very personally motivated as we go through the world and we see friends of ours with various print and other disabilities not being able to access this brand new, somewhat brave world, which is increasingly the way of things, it's digital. We kind of scratch our heads and wonder, why isn't the law working and where is the law and why is there not voluntary compliance for things like businesses? Don't we want as many customers as, as we can? So that was some of the, the motivation for doing it. And this book focuses mostly on, on the US, with the next one being outside the US. But as far as assistive technology or AT, there's the basic type of AT that we think about for transportation, like a power wheelchair or an electronic prosthetic. There's AT that is more focused towards communication, like augmentative communication, boards and devices, uh, apps. And there's technology for information. Um, how do you get standard computer applications and web access? And that's been a lot of our focus on this book. Um, for ICT accessibility, people with various impairments or disabilities use all kinds of different types of technologies. And some of them will be readily familiar, screen readers, braille displays, alternative keyboards or pointing devices, depending on how your hands and other parts work, speak recognition technology, many of which have all been adopted by mainstream non-disability groups as being facilitatory and, and increasing productivity. Um, relying on captions or transcripts, which of course also helps our friends who are not native English speakers and or have other sorts of access challenges. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Good one afternoon, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that uh, we've been talking about for a few years and I've really been hitting home on is this idea that people with disabilities must have equal access to technology and it has to be at the same time, it has to be the same content, and it has to be the same price. And the idea is if you give people sort of a second class level of access where you say, well, we're going to give you access to some of the information or we're going to give you access to the information, but it's going to be a few weeks later, right? It's really problematic and you're really then turned into being a second class citizen. And so you see situations where universities, right? The textbooks maybe are not accessible and the universities say, well, we're working on it. We'll get you the textbook by about week nine of the semester. Week nine? You know, you're getting really a second class education then. You're not able to follow along. Right? There have been issues in the US with access to emergency information, right? But information about hurricane preparedness is not useful three days after the hurricane already went through. If you have a radio show and you don't have live captioning, the individual who is deaf is not going to be able to call in. They'll get a transcript two days later and they won't be able to actually speak with the panelists. They won't be able to ask questions. In terms of the same content, it's important that people with disabilities have access to the same content, not a different version of the content, not a summarized version, not a shorthand version, not a version designed for children. Sometimes when you ask companies to make their websites accessible, they'll say, well, we're not going to do that, but our mobile app, Use the mobile app, right? That's, that's more accessible. And it only has half of the functionality. Uh, there is a, a settlement between Monster.com and the Massachusetts Attorney General, right? Because what would happen is that people would call up Monster.com. They were blind individuals. They would call up Monster.com because Monster.com's website wasn't accessible. Now, do you really think that Monster.com is going to read you 100 jobs that are open on the phone? You know they won't. Right? You can't expect them to. And the idea is that if you have access to the same content, it should be exactly the same content. And so rather than do these things where you say, oh, we're going to make a separate accommodation for you. We're going to make this other thing work. Here's an alternative. No, you want to make sure that the technology, the digital content is accessible so that someone with a disability can get access at the exact same time to the exact same content and also, it should be the same price, right? So one of the issues that comes up is that if you have an e-commerce website and they say, you know, we have web-only specials, but you can't get those specials at the local store and the website doesn't work because it's inaccessible for you, that means you're going to pay a higher fare. Uh, there is a Justice Department settlement with Megabus. You know, Megabus, the bus's fare is as low as $1. But that's only if you can use it, the website, and that website was inaccessible. I've done a lot of research about airlines. And airlines would always say, you call them up, lower fares available on our website, right? But if the website was inaccessible, you would call up, you'd get charged a higher fare. You can't charge someone more because they have a disability. That's not legal and that's not right. So inaccessible websites and inaccessible technologies lead to things like Pricing discrimination, right? They lead to isolation, forms of employment discrimination. You know, if most places now require you apply for a job online, what happens if the application online is not accessible? So do you then have to call up the employer and say, I can't apply for your job online? And they say, why? And you say, well, I have a disability. And you don't really have to say in a hiring process that you have a disability. It leads to all these forms of societal exclusion when technologies and digital content are inaccessible. But the key thing to remember is that accessibility is actually innovation. There are many technologies that are used by everyone, by the general public, that started out as assistive technologies, as accessibility features for people with disabilities. So ebooks started out as audiobooks for the blind. Speech recognition, when you talk to your phone, that started out as an input for people with motor impairments. Captioning, right? Captioning started out obviously as a way for people who are deaf or hard of hearing 
to access video content and TV shows. Anyone here know, by the way, what was the first, it's a local TV show, what was the first TV show to be captioned? Just yell it out if you know it. Yes, who said Julia Child? The French chef, who said that? Oh, good job, all right. It's one of local interest. Even things like image recognition. Image recognition researchers are leading the way. They're focused on accessibility, but they're helping make image recognition work for everyone. So accessibility means innovation. When you make it better for people with disabilities, you lead to all sorts of new potential approaches, new techniques, new opportunities for everyone. And it's important to remember that inaccessible information and communication technology, it reduces the quality of life for people with disabilities. It's not a theory. It's not some hypothetical thing. It's real discrimination that occurs every single day. And that's why we're so excited that you're all here today to learn more about this and uh, hear us talk. Let me just, just either by show of hands or saying yay or waving like this, right? How many people are familiar with the basics of technology accessibility? Either say yay or by, by hands. Okay, how many people are familiar with the web content accessibility guidelines? Okay, that's great. How many people are familiar with disability rights laws in the US and how they relate to technology? Okay, this is good. We've got an expert crowd. Mm. This is great. There you go. So we will only do it as a quick laundry list, but basically the disability laws in the U.S. have been out there for quite some time and of course have applied to technology for quite some time. And you see it has a range of things from communications to voting to education, etc. Um, what's been a bit Perplexing to us is how long it took our Department of Justice to figure out that the web is part of the built environment and the social environment and that they actually need to issue regulations and control this area. Of course, it's somewhat more perplexing to us when we do checks to see how many federal government websites, open government access, is not accessible to citizens. Um, and including, we did one study on emergency alerts and you would think that those would, in particular, be accessible, and, and they're not. Um, other laws from, from outside the US, the EU, of course, has a mandate on it. The UK Equality Act, which used to be a disability act, which was then subsumed into an omnibus act. Uh, in Australia, Disability Discrimination Act, Germany, Spain, Italy, and various other places and, and policies. Globally, um, we like to refer to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD, which has an Article 9 specifically calling on countries to promote and make information and communication technologies accessible to persons with disabilities, including the internet, and they specifically listed the internet. Um, it was not exactly a controversial issue during the negotiations, um, but a lot of the people there were very forward thinking, um, and, and it was enjoyable to work with them on thinking about that. In addition, Article 21 provides for information as part of freedom of information. Part of it is to be able to access that information. And of course, we can think about its connections to all areas of life, ranging from voting, political participation, socializing, communicating, et cetera. Um, in thinking about this book, John and I came up with a list of areas where human rights law, disability rights law, and ICT access intersect. And we sort of thought about it as there are places where the questions are settled, legally speaking, but the technology hasn't quite caught up with it and isn't quite being applied to it. Areas where the technology is defined and readily available, but the legal questions haven't yet to be settled. And then the whole area of international development. So between the CRPD that we just mentioned and the Sustainable Development Goals, which are now in effect how are countries going to be intersecting on the issue of making their digital environments accessible to all users? How are they going to leverage it for things ranging from poverty alleviation to education, higher education, to civic participation? One of the really interesting things is about how um, technologies and ideas and concepts that you wouldn't immediately think of as naturally leading from one to the other, in this context, actually make a lot of sense. So one of the chapters in the book, and this is an edited book, and we have a number of contributors uh, 
who submitted chapters, and so we had some of the world's leading experts, and it's a fantastic, we really enjoyed putting together this book. Including Mary Ziegler. Including Mary Ziegler, that's right, who's sitting in the back. Hi, Mary, from MIT. And one of the really interesting things is that international technical standards, so we talked about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, right? That is really the leading international technical standard for not only websites, but also for non-web technologies. There's a whole set of guidance, WCAG2 ICT, for translating it into non-web technologies. So it's an international technical standard, but the reality is it's really a human rights document, right? Because it deals with how do we make sure that everyone has equal access. And what's happened since the first version of the WCAG in 1999, what's happened is that most countries around the world that have some level of disability rights or human rights law, they have adopted WCAG, now in version 2.0, as their standard, right? And so then what's happened is that other laws have, put in, uh, have been put in place that relate to procurement and spending of government money, and that somehow has reference back to the WCAG. And so you basically have a technical standard that's then really become a human rights document. It's really then been used to help make sure that everyone has equal access. It's been used as the guideline, as the standard for countries around the world. It's been used for every type of measurement that you can think of, every type of evaluation that you can think of. And so really, a technical standard has become, in many ways, a human rights document. So among our questions were, do people with print disabilities have a legal right to access ebooks? And now that whole area has just been overdone by the Marrakesh Treaty, which the wonderful Ruth Okadiji, who teaches here, was right in the center of negotiating. And Ruth and Larry Helfer, our graduate and friend, and Molly Land, who's down at UConn, put together a wonderful guide for states on how to comply with the Marrakesh Treaty and its intersection with IP laws. So how much can these things flow cross borders? And what are the local cultural implications of either adhering to or not adhering to IP laws? And the answer is it depends on factors such as publisher prerogative. And by and large, they are supportive, although well, sometimes they're not. Um, who's publishing the book? What sort of ebook device are you using? How many waivers the FCC grants? And that's actually a real factor. It's well established in many human rights documents that privacy is a human right. I think no one would argue with that. But what happens when you're talking about privacy and sort of its sibling security online and technology? Well, Michael earlier mentioned about you have these areas that we focused on in this book, where either you've got well-established law, but the computer scientists have not come up yet with a solution, or you've got well-established technology where really the legal community doesn't yet have a framework to address. Privacy and security are interesting because really, neither one is totally defined yet, either on the technical side or the legal side. Obviously, security is always ongoing, and privacy always ongoing about how you make that happen just from a technical side. You come up with a solution, and then it gets hacked. Well, what happens when you add in this aspect of law, and you add in people with disabilities, and Privacy is well established in the CRPD and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it's really not well established in the technical community or the legal community how you figure out privacy and security with technology for people with disabilities. You know, one of the most common questions I get as a teacher, as a researcher, as an advocate, I get this question often. Why do drive up ATM machines have braille or audio? Are blind people going to drive? Right? And, but that's a really common question. And, and of course, the answer is, well, you don't want to have a situation where, let's say, they're in a car, right? Let's say it's in a taxi, and this, the machine is inaccessible. And so the taxi driver says, well, what's your password? I'll put your password in for you. Right? Or a situation where you have to give a password to a friend. You want all the machines, all the ATM machines, to be accessible. Right? You also don't want to have a separate version. Oh, here's the accessible version. We're going to charge more for it. Here's the inaccessible version. You want the same version to be used at a walk-up ATM, at a wheel-up ATM, at a drive-up ATM, right? at a kiosk-based ATM. You want the same version that's fully accessible. Because if it's not accessible, that means that you're giving your PIN to someone else. And you don't want to do that. 
Another thing to think about is the issue of disability status, right? If there is a way, you're using assistive technology, you're using a screen reader, you're using some other assistive technology or some other operating system tweak or some app, if there's a way that that can be tracked that you use that, that's then a way to track that you have a disability. Do you want your disability status to be available and known online? Do you want companies to do that? In fact, there are even, now there are uh, even researchers who are working on using key patterns, keystroke patterns on a keyboard to determine the presence of disability. So what are the implications here? If based on how you're interacting, either a different input-output device or application, or even a different speed, if that can be used to determine disability status, how would you feel about that? Right? How do we need to then change our legal framework to say, no, it's not OK to track disability status and then use that to discriminate against someone? Even things like the end user license agreements, the EULAs, or terms of service agreements. Many times, right, how many people actually read? Again, show of hands or say yay. How many people actually read the licensing agreements? OK, we, we have two or three hands here. How many people, though, want the right to read them in case you decide you want to read them? OK, most of you want the ability to read them. Think about this. How many times is that license agreement superimposed on top of the screen in an inaccessible pop-up and maybe also a color that's not very readable? in really small print, mind you. So people with color blindness, it's going to be an issue. People uh, who are blind or low vision, it's going to be an issue. People who just can't read small print, it's going to be an issue. And also think about the fact that they're usually worded in such a way that even if you can make out the print, you can't understand what it says anyway. You know, it's 30 pages long. It uses legalese. The average uh, user is not going to be able to understand it. So all of these fascinating topics at the intersection of privacy, Security, right? Disability, law, technology. I mean, there's, there's just like a boatload of interesting questions here. And how are we going to make sure that when using digital technology, people with disabilities have still the right to privacy, the right to security? How are we going to make sure that passwords can work for them? How are we going to make sure that their information will be used in a way that they're aware of? Even something like a lot of people use their phones. A lot of people use them for GPS devices. How do we make sure that that can be used without identifying the location of every individual and allowing them to be tracked? Something to think about. Now, here's, here's one of my favorite topics in the book, is access to computer gaming, a fundamental human right. And I'll admit, when I originally posed this as a chapter idea to Michael, he was a little bit skeptical, would you say? I can show them my flip phone. They'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because at first you think, gaming, why is that a fundamental human right? But when you think of how computer gaming is used now, when you think of how much it's used in education, when you think of the gaming simulations that are used as employment tests before, when you're applying for a job, right? if you think of the simulations that are used, the gaming simulations that are used in doctor's offices, right? If you think of how they're used in driving simulations, basically they're used in education, they're used in employment, and by the way, they're also used for socialization. If everyone else is playing Dance Dance Revolution, you want to be a part of that, right? And of course, there is an article in the CRPD that's all about recreation, mm -hmm. right? Certainly, there's an article related to employment. There's an article related to um, education. And so the more that gaming is used in all these areas, we have to start thinking of computer gaming as a fundamental human right. And there's a chapter by my colleague, uh, Joyram Chakraborty, all about that, looking at computer gaming through the lens of the CRPD and how we're going to make gaming more inclusive. It was a very fun chapter. Of course, they all are. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So access to ICT for people with cognitive impairments. This was something that Jonathan, by the way, has done great research on in the, in the area of Down syndrome and others. But the legal world does not differentiate between the legal rights of someone with a perceptual or a motor impairment and someone with a cognitive impairment. There's a mandate for inclusion. But the world of computer science and the web, if you go look around on it, has only started to understand how people with various forms of intellectual, cognitive, and other impairments need access to ICT. One of the interesting things in some of that research involving people with Down syndrome 
we actually found that people with Down syndrome, as long as they've had computing classes and they've had keyboarding classes, they didn't need any accommodations. They didn't use any assistive technology. They used no modifications. They used everything straight up out of the box. Very interesting. You know, the, typically, we think of people with disabilities using an assistive technology, right? Not in that situation. And they're better at captures, too. And they're better. That's, I'm so glad you mentioned right. that. So one of the more really interesting things that I've found over years of research, I'm always fascinated by the studies that wind up demonstrating that people with disabilities have a competitive advantage where they actually do something better than the general population. We found this in a few situations. One is that, you know the security features known as CAPTCHAs? Before you fill out a web-based form, there's like twisted visual text or audio. Uh, we found that people with Down syndrome, how many people actually like those? Yeah, not so much. Um, but we actually found that people with Down syndrome actually complete those successfully at a higher rate than the general population. Right? Very interesting. Uh, in some of the work that I've done about blind users, we've actually found that blind users are more effective at dealing with errors and frustrations on the internet right, and on the web than the typical population, than the general population. They're faster. They have better workaround solutions. They don't give up. One of my blind friends said, well, that makes sense. A lot of times things don't work for us right the first time. We're good problem solvers. Right? And if you think about it, it makes sense. Right? So I'm fascinated by these areas, these, uh, these research studies, that find that people with disabilities actually have a competitive advantage. They're actually better than the general population at something. So what role can libraries play? And there are lots of many different types of libraries. You have public libraries. You have research libraries at universities. We have the great Harvard Law Library. And libraries have a really interesting role to play. So for public libraries, right, they often serve in all these different roles we don't realize. They serve in sort of the role of social work. They serve as community centers. They serve as that third space. And uh, the chapter in the book focuses on public libraries, but a lot of this work is applicable, uh, applicable to other libraries as well. And so a great example is that libraries have often thought of themselves as, well, you know, we provide printed materials. And if you have a print disability, maybe you go to the State Library for the Blind. But the reality is most public libraries are now shifting their resources so that they're more digital. Right? So it's much more about digital databases and access online. Well, wait a minute. If you're providing mostly digital resources, then you as a public library can actually serve the population of people with print disabilities at your local library. You don't have to refer them somewhere else. And how do you then make sure that when you acquire these resources, you're not acquiring inaccessible resources, but instead what you're doing is you're putting into the procurement agreement or you're putting into the contract, we will only procure accessible materials. You're demanding of the vendors, you're putting it in the contract, we will procure only accessible materials. Right? Uh, one of my favorite examples always of procurement contracts and materials is from Ohio State University. Right? They actually do testing of a lot of the technologies and the digital resources that they procure. And they do testing to ensure that it's accessible. And one time um, they said, sorry to the vendor, we cannot procure this. Our testing shows this is inaccessible. The vendor said, no, it is fully accessible. Ohio State said, no, it's not accessible. No, vendor said, it is fully accessible. We guarantee it. Here are the results of the testing we've done. And so Ohio State said, would you be OK putting in an indemnification clause? So if Ohio State gets sued because we're using inaccessible technology, as a vendor, would you agree to that? So basically, you're the one on the hook, not us, because we think it's inaccessible. The vendor actually said yes. So here's my question. Why aren't more universities using this approach? Right? Why aren't more universities pressuring vendors? Why aren't more public libraries pressuring vendors? You know, a lot of times, we have to realize that all of these big buyers, federal government, state government, public universities, private universities, research libraries, public libraries, they're all buyers. They're all consumers. And we have to get all these consumers to say, we are only buying if your technology, your resources, your digital content, if they are accessible. We're only buying if you agree to that and make it accessible. And you actually see some state university systems are doing that. The Cal State system has been doing that for a while. Some private universities are starting to do that. But think about it. This is an example. If we want equal access, what do we need to do? We need to work with the technical people, 
we need to work with the vendors and we need to work with university council and we need to work with the lawyers to make sure that all those requirements are in the contracts. Michael mentioned earlier about open government. A few years ago, I was involved in an effort to uh, submit a number of Freedom of Information Act requests to the federal government to document what they were and in many cases were not doing related to compliance for people with disabilities, right? And there was a way of saying, look, if you provide us documentation that says you're doing nothing or you can't provide us anything, we know there's a problem. My, the example that I use often, because I think it was the most egregious, through these FOIA requests, we actually found a document from the Department of Labor. Now think about it for a minute, the Department of Labor. The US Department of Labor actually applied for a waiver saying that they did not want to, right? They did not want to require their technologies be accessible. The Department of Labor, they said, we don't currently employ any people with disabilities. So we, should, we think that, think about it, Department of Labor. <laughs> Department of Labor said, we don't currently employ any people with disabilities in this area. So we think we should be able to get a waiver from Section 508 to be able to procure inaccessible technology. And of course, what would happen when they, if they could get a waiver, which they couldn't, right? Waivers don't work that way in Section 508. But if they got a waiver, they'd purchase this inaccessible technology. And then the next time they have an employee applicant with a disability, they'd say, sorry, we can't hire you. The technology won't work for you. So basically, they said, we don't have employees with disabilities currently. And if we're going to procure this technology, we're going to make it impossible for anyone with a disability to be employed. The next time you see an open government initiative, open government, open data, ask the people involved, is accessibility included? Because open should mean open to everyone. And the open government directive from uh, the White House in the last administration was not about accessibility. And they refused to include it as one of their goals for openness and transparency. So apparently, openness and transparency only means if you don't have a disability. Right. Each one of these things we're talking about, by the way, is a separate chapter in the book, and certainly we hope you read. So there's a chapter on open government, there's a chapter on libraries, right? Uh, there's a chapter on what do you do if there are no national disability rights laws. So in Canada, where they have yet to develop their national disability law, often you are pushed down on many areas down to provincial laws, just as we are pushed down in some cases to state level laws that in some cases can be rather progressive and in some cases might be behind the ball as far as rights-based approach. Um, other common challenges to using assistive technology in developing countries, one we saw was a lack of training support, obviously a lack of infrastructure, a lack of awareness of technical opportunities, lack of connectivity and also awareness in rural areas, um, sometimes these are filled by community service organizations such as disabled people's organizations, in-person and online communities of other people with disabilities. And sometimes we see barriers as far as the stigma associated with being an AT accessible technology user. And again, the next book focuses more on technology in the developing world. Right, in this book we briefly touch on the developing world. But it's actually fascinating to think about the developing world, and we cover this a little bit in the book. Because if you think about our infrastructures, our technology infrastructures, and our physical infrastructures, in the developed world, in many cases, they're complete. But in the developing world, right now, those infrastructures are being built, the physical infrastructures. Right? What's the relationship between the physical infrastructure and the technical infrastructure? Right? Anytime you want to talk about web accessibility, people will often describe it as, well, it's like the curb cut for the internet. You've heard that. The curb cut for the internet. So think about it. If we often explain web accessibility and technology accessibility using metaphors from our physical world of what we expect in a developed country, right? in terms of we have elevators, we have wide enough doors, right? how do we explain that in a developing country? How do we get people to expect accessibility of a technical infrastructure when we don't even see accessibility of a physical infrastructure? Right? How can we make it 
so that as millions and billions of dollars are being spent in developing countries, in many cases, it's the developed countries who are spending in the developing countries, how can we make sure that we're not spending money to build barriers that will then be there for the next 100 years? How do we make sure that we get this into the development process? Anytime you talk about accessibility, people will say, well, what's the cost? And I always say, well, if you do it right, the cost is almost nothing. If you build in accessibility as the building is being built, as the street is being built, as the technology is being built, right? it costs almost nothing. There's a great example here from, um, from Massachusetts state government. Uh, there was a great conference last fall at the Grad School of Ed. There you go, see? I, 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 she did a great job, Eileen did a great job uh, organizing that. And one of the people from the Grad School of Ed conference worked for the state of Massachusetts. And he said, look, we basically found that if we do it the right way, right, if we plan ahead and we're just, the next time we do the, um, we're renovating the website, we put in all the accessibility features we want in the planning, so we're building it in, we're not retrofitting. He said, maybe it adds a half percent, one percent to the budget, not much. He said, when we find that we're going afterwards, after we've built everything and adding on all these sort of, you know, these accommodations after the fact, these basically things that we have to hack in, he said, it's about 10%. Right? So anytime someone says cost, ask someone, is this the cost because you didn't plan it right in the first place? <laughs> but no, seriously, because if you have to retrofit a building and add elevators afterwards, of course it's going to be expensive. It's the same way for technology. And so ask people, anytime they give you a cost, say, wait, is that because of your poor planning that it costs that much? We're going to be bold and say that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that because of your poor planning? Is that why it costs so much? We want to make sure that as technology infrastructures are being built in other countries, in developing countries, that barriers are not added in. We want to make sure that it's done the right way the first time. And conversely, there's also very good practices from the global south. So because they don't have the resources to squander, and because they have to think more intelligently, and because they're beginning from further back in the curve, we have good examples such as emergency evacuation and location in Ecuador, or the legal structure to creating accessible ICT in Colombia, where there's actually a part of the president's office that, that focuses on it. Um, sometimes what we see is, is that governments like Kenya and Mozambique have less influence over the global markets, and so consumers, of course, have less options as far as what to purchase or what they can purchase. Um, very often, the story is that products, much like anything else in development, are imported from the global north to citizens in the south and are done so at their prices and then, of course, rely on upgrades and fixes and, and additional applications that come from it. But on the other hand, there are also things like Apple products that are extremely accessible. Everything in your Apple product comes with the accessibility features. You need to turn them off rather than turn them on. But uh, your typical iPhone, which is around 300 euros, $450, is not exactly going to be attractive or available to many people who are living on a dollar a day or somewhere near that amount. We mentioned at the beginning that our, uh, the workshop that led to this, the exploratory seminar or workshop uh, at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. We want to thank the Radcliffe Institute again for funding uh, the workshop. And that was in 2015 and many of the workshop participants wound up contributing uh, to the book. And we're actually holding the next Radcliffe workshop uh, in June 2018, and we're going to be focusing specifically on this topic of technology accessibility in the developing world, which is really a, a topic that hasn't uh, gotten much attention yet, but it's one that's so important. For what we're, the reasons we were talking about with barriers, right? as these technological infrastructures are being built now, we want to make sure that barriers are not introduced. We want to make sure that they are built accessibly. And we want to make sure at the same time that, as Michael just mentioned, right, that it's culturally sensitive, it's economically sensitive. Don't just say, give everyone an iPhone, because that won't work. And we look for solutions that come from the ground up in these developing countries. Uh, we actually, you mentioned the example of uh, Ecuador. right? Ecuador is actually ahead of the US in terms of emergency preparedness for people with disabilities, right? 
even in remote locations. They've actually tracked where people are located using GPS. They have a whole plan in place. Now you compare that to many of the problems that we've seen at uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management in the US, where there have been a lot of times that people with disabilities are left behind. So we really enjoy doing this book, as we were talking about. Uh, we encourage you to read through many of the chapters. I mean, we've got everything from uh, voting and accessibility to web accessibility, again, for people with uh, cognitive disabilities, financing issues, human rights laws, access to courts, and the technology in courts, and the records in courts for people with disabilities. Uh, Fred Letterer, who is director of the, what's the center at William & Mary? It's changed. It's now the future 55th century court project. <laughs> right? It's a fascinating chapter about making sure that the court process is accessible, and all the technology used in court is accessible. Um, the issue about captioning, right? And what the IP issues are related to captioning has value. Sometimes you think of these technologies and you say, oh, that was just built. Someone with a disability will use it. Almost everyone uses captioning. You use captioning, whether or not you have a disability, you use captioning at the bar at the airport. You use captioning at the gym. You use captioning when you're a place you forgot your headphones and you can't uh, sit in the library and watch a movie. Well, not out loud, at least. So you use captioning. Captioning is also used by search engines. It makes videos searchable. Captioning is used as metadata to make everything easier to find on the internet. So when you have IP laws, and in many cases, were really designed for, well, there's no value aside from the value for people with disabilities. And then you have to figure out, wait, this has value for everyone. How do we do this? There are so many fascinating questions at the intersection of disability rights law, human rights law, technology for people with disabilities, international development. Um, it was a thrill to work on editing this book with Michael. It's a thrill to work with, with, all of these, uh, with, all the co with all of the chapter authors. And certainly, we look forward, I think, at this point to, to questions. Mm. Right? Comments, questions? So we'll pass the mic for okay. questions. You can go right if you like. was a real treat to hear you guys talk about it. I've got a question about trade-offs between accessibility and security, and whether there are times when manufacturers make claims about them that are not ours, whether you believe actually there are some questions about accessibility that also uh, decrease data security and the desire from accessibility perspectives, what are your thoughts about both from the perspective of the manufacturer, but also the communicator was thinking about, for example, in a breach case, would that be a defense to say, well, we can adopt X technology in order to make it more accessible? Would it, by contrast, be a defense against a claim for lack of accessibility in you know, these breach claims? Comes up a lot or something like that. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, great question, Glenn. Uh, great to see you here. Um, it's a really interesting thing because take out accessibility for a minute. Security by its nature is hard to use, right? If you think about it from a usability point of view, what do we want to do? We want to make everything as easy as possible. We want to make the flow as easy as possible. And any type of security feature will stop us from doing that, right? It's, what's really interesting, though, is that often when we think about security, people will say, well, add this security approach. Do this. Do this. This is more secure. Oh, and we can't make it accessible, kind of what you're describing. Very often, they don't actually have the testing done to determine how secure it is. So anyone who says this is 100% foolproof, bulletproof, we've tested it, it's fully secure, they're not really being truthful. Security is a moving target. And it's actually one of the hardest moving targets from an accessibility point of view. Because as I mentioned, we look at a lot of these issues and it's, well, one's well-defined and the other one's a frontier. In security, for people with disabilities, the legal issues are a frontier and the technical issues. Um, so that's really an, a very interesting question. Now, what I would always say is any time that you are, uh, any time developers, I should say, are working on building a, a new type of security, involve people with disabilities in the process. Get feedback from them. Right? Figure out what alternate approaches <coughs> might work. So, for instance, one of the um, things that happens often in security is people say, well, 
you know, these, these passwords aren't working, these things aren't working, right? We're just going to move to biometrics. Okay, so biometrics, that sounds great, but if you're going to use a fingerprint scanner, what do you do if someone doesn't have a finger? What do you do, right? Retina scanner, what do you do if someone has a, um, if someone has a glass eye, right? Someone is unable to speak, voice recognition. So what you always want to try to plan for is to make sure that you have multiple ways in, right? Multiple ways in. If you're doing something like biometrics, even if you're not doing something like biometrics, you want to make sure, though, that it's been tested properly. And so anyone, though, who makes the claim that our security feature is perfect, it's foolproof. They're always, I mean, you see that right now in the news all the time, that it's not really true. And so it is really a challenging area. Um, but it has to be balanced with the fact that you can't just say, OK, you have a disability. Sorry, none of our security features work for you. Um, so if you want this to have a password, you just need to have a friend do it. Because obviously, you know, there, there's liability there as well. Right? If you're making it so people with disabilities can't get access to their private health information, to their banking information. And think about it. These are really important issues. Uh, if you are blind or have a print disability, probably getting a printout from your healthcare provider won't really be helpful for you. Your bank statement on paper, eh, so are you going to hire someone to read it for you? Or are you going to try to put it through OCR, optical character recognition, and identify it? You'd prefer not to. You'd rather that it's actually in fully accessible digital format. Um, so this is a challenging area, but it really is two-headed. It's not only, well, we want to make sure it's secure, but we want to make sure that we are doing it in a way that we're not excluding anyone so that they can't then come back and say, well, look, it didn't work for me, so I had to pass off my password to someone else. And they then uh, did something bad with that information. So especially in the area of uh, healthcare data, it, it really is an important area and one that we hope uh, through this chapter more people will pay attention to. Hopefully more research will, researchers will investigate this. There's a mm -hmm. small number of researchers working at the intersection of usability and security. And I think they're really going to be the best hope because they're really interested in both. And that's a good way to attack the problem. Realize, though, that they're not just issues for people with disabilities. Security features are problematic for everyone from a usability point of view. And they're also often not secure. Other questions? Yes. Thank you, professors, for your wonderful speech. I have a, a question regarding human augmentation. So there are a lot of technology now trying to make human with uh, extra capacities, such as, right. for example, there's Neuralink by Elon Musk, Musk trying to connect people's brain to computers. And the Brain Co. is trying to um, use technology to help people improve like memory and other um, capacities. So if people, some people can have access to this technology, do you think uh, when we design it or when this technology during its diffusion period, should there be kind of concerns to, because it's also kind of trying to make a distinction. So apart from the technology you mentioned here, do you think those technology should also be put into concern? Well, there should always be concerns about and, and embracing in times of new technologies and new approaches, but also very strong ethical examinations of what it is that we're augmenting and who it is that we're augmenting and what ways we are augmenting. Better is not always better or more ethical. And we also need to think about what the downsides are. Can we draw an analogy from what's the first part of what you said? From, from like the rights of persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. like it's also about accommodation problem um, right, to some extent. Like if people can have these technologies, so they have better access to maybe grades and success in education and other things. So I would think um, one of the concerns there would be you never want to be in a situation where with all these uh, sort of augmented cognition, and we'll talk about other approaches as well that you could, you could say everything from a cochlear implant to um, some of the augmented cognition you're talking about. You never want to be in a situation where you tell someone you have to use this, right? You have to use this augmented cognition. You have to. If there are technologies that are developed, whether those are technologies to help blind people see, right, or uh, again, cochlear implant, augmented cognition, 
We want to be clear, though, that you don't need to use that, right? That that's not a requirement. We're, we're not saying as a society, you're less than unless you use this technology. I think that would be really my concern. I mean, these things are interesting uh, research ideas. But for instance, one of, uh, one of the things, you know, I, you probably find this as well, as someone who's a disability advocate, someone who works on disability research, people will start telling me, oh, I'm building this new technology which is going to allow blind people to see. And I'm building this new technology which will allow, which in many ways what they're saying is we don't think you're OK as you are. We want to build this thing so you can be OK again. I always find that really troubling. Right? And I think we'd want to make sure that uh, the rights of people with disabilities are not trampled upon by some of these new technologies and what the requirements might be for using them. Uh, what wouldn't you say? Well, it's part of a very large and ongoing debate that we've seen in disability and elsewhere on difference versus deficit, on equality versus equality plus, um, and also who has access to these things. Um, also, it's a question of what is it that we expect to take Jonathan's comment a different way. What is it that we expect to be the baseline of human performance, quality of life, and existence? And what judgments do we make, socially constructed or otherwise, about people who are not on that baseline? Time for one more question. Right here. Yeah. Kyle. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Kyle Shackman from Harvard X. Uh, your uh, discussion near the end about uh, developing worlds and building uh, infrastructure in places that does not exist uh, made me think of, of ways we do that now digitally, like augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, I was wondering if any of your um, research or tests or cases have, have, have explored that. I'm guessing that's a question for me since it's technical. Mm. Um, OK, so augmented reality and virtual reality. That's actually not something that I've done research on, but there are people who are doing research on making sure that virtual worlds are accessible. So I think of, for instance, uh, Shari Trewin, um, and IBM, and a few others. Um, there actually is a lot of work going on to make sure, because again, the more you're moving towards virtual reality for education, very similar to what we were talking about with gaming, the more you're using these alternate new technologies for things that are required in society, right? Training, education, you want to make sure that they are made to be accessible. And certainly, they can be accessible. I mean, there are, cert there are ways of making, for instance, if you think of visual virtual reality, there are ways of doing that with sonification, you know, of coming up with equivalents for users who are blind. right? There are ways to navigate through a virtual world if you don't have any hands. So there certainly are researchers working on this. It's not something I've been working on, but I think certainly it is very important that anything that's being built is being built accessibly. And what we try to do is always encourage people not only to design based on guidelines, but to involve people in the process, involve people with disabilities in the process. The guidelines are great, but you also need to have committees of people with disabilities and various disabilities. You need to have the stakeholders who are actually going to use the technologies being involved. And so that's to any company, to any university. I'd say put together an advisory committee. Seek their input regularly. Make sure you have a really diverse group of people with different types of disabilities at a university level, students, faculty, staff, things like that. And so that way you can, that you can make sure that you're getting feedback to ensure you're being inclusive as you're building these, again, new infrastructures, virtual worlds, gaming. These things are all, they can be built accessibly. You know, anytime someone says, no, we can't make this accessible, I usually try to stop them right there and challenge them, well, why not? Well, who have you consulted with on this? Have you asked any blind people? Have you asked any people who are deaf? Have you asked any people uh, with motor impairments? Have you, and I usually give this list, and they say, well, no. Well, then how do you know that it can't be done? Because you didn't personally, personally think about how to do it and how to solve it. It doesn't mean there's no solution. Most of the time, uh, so one of my friends in, in Maryland, Mike Bullis, directs the um, Maryland Image Center, which is very much about empowerment and independence. And he always says, look, he said, the core problem is that most of the issues for people with disabilities have already been solved, and 95% of the world doesn't know how they've been solved. 
So people say they can't be solved, right? When in fact someone's already solved it and they just don't know about it. And so I always encourage people, reach out to, just anytime you're building any new technology, if it's something where it's not as clear cut and you're saying, I don't know how to do this, I mean, Kyle, you'd be the perfect person to reach out to. And Mary, if you have any questions about accessibility, reach out uh, to Kyle here at Harvard or Mary at MIT, right? And they would know the people to look for. They would know the people to consult. They would know the resources to consult. Often when we say something can't be made accessible, that only means we didn't look hard enough and we don't know anyone and we're really kind of busy and so we just decided it probably wasn't accessible and it just couldn't be done, right? And so engagement with stakeholders, involving people with disabilities in all phases of development, in consulting in every way, shape, and form, that's what's really gonna make the difference. Bringing in people with disabilities into a full participatory design into any type of systems development. Don't assume you know what people know and how to do it, right? Bring them in, find out what it is they need, work with them to make sure you're meeting their needs, which I know both Mary and Kyle do. I think really that's the solution for a lot of what you're talking about with uh, virtual worlds, right? There are already technical solutions out there. Many people have built accessible virtual worlds. It's getting the expertise and the knowledge and the awareness that it does exist to the right people rather than saying, oh, you know, it's busy, it's a Friday afternoon, oh, I didn't have a chance to search for it, I don't know anyone, I'll just put down it's not accessible. And that also includes the clinical aspects. So one of the really interesting, quickly developing areas in virtual reality is it's used as a, as a remedy. So there's work going on here about schizophrenia, using virtual reality as a kind of treatment. And behind that and, and next in line is autism, using it as a training device, a social interaction training device. If, you have, if you're on the spectrum and you have difficulties interacting with others, picking up social cues, you can have a relatively stress-free, non-judgmental ability to game your social interactions with people you haven't met before and see what exactly the social cues are, what is an acceptable response, what is a reading, what is not a reading. Those are some of the things that are coming down. And as Jonathan points out, any application where, of course, where you're using human subjects, you need to include those subjects in part of the process of making sure it's done ethically and properly. Thank you very much. On behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all for coming and joining us today. Thank you to our authors, Professor Stein, Professor Lazar, for this absolutely amazing talk. I hope you'll come back. And um, as this is the technology yeah. is progressing so rapidly, that this is definitely, uh, we will be due for an update in even a year. I Great. hope so. Please so do. Yeah. Um, I just remind everyone that when the coop is outside the door with books for sale, I can't wait to read more. And I hope you feel the same. All right, thanks again. Thank you.